A very warm welcome on, uh, on behalf of everyone uh, at EFREC at, uh, at uh, our conference uh, today. We're really uh, pleased that you're all here. Uh, my name is, uh, is Mark Fassen. I'm uh, an EFREC board member. And I've been asked today to take on the important role of master of ceremony, so I'm told. Um, the conference today is really to mark a, a happy occasion, and that's the establishment of the, uh, the European Reporting Lab at EFRAC. And I think that's a, a real uh, important uh, event uh, that uh, uh, started in, in November, and we're here actually today to, to mark that it's, uh, that it's ongoing. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, a very exciting development. Uh, first of all, uh, we're in a, in, a, in a relatively small room here, but it's great that we have such a large and, and distinguished audience uh, together here today. Uh, and thank you all for making the time you know, to come and listen and also participate in the discussion today. Um, I think we have an impressive list of speakers lined up for you uh, for, for the afternoon. And then we are particularly very honored that uh, uh, we will have the pleasure of the company of, uh, of Vice Presidents uh, Dombrowski uh, in a moment, who will give the keynote speech and set the scene for the rest of this afternoon. So the, the title of the conference is uh, Fostering Innovation in Corporate Reporting. And I think uh, that notion of fostering innovation is really exactly what is needed. Uh, and it may sound a bit as a, as a cliche, I'm not the first one to say it, but I, I genuinely believe that with respect to corporate reporting, we are on a journey. And as with any journey, uh, you stay a while where you are, and you think it's comfortable here, and uh, 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 it is convenient, and then at some point you realize, but now I need to move on. And I think that's also the journey that we've made in, uh, in, in reporting, and for me, and I think for many here, also in terms of your own professional experience, the journey started with, uh, with IFRS as a first step, where, where Europe uh, really took a, a lead globally uh, to, uh, to endorse uh, IFRS, and that still is the main focus of EFREC, uh, by the way, and his work at EFREC. Um, and while financial reporting remains an important cornerstone uh, of the reporting framework, uh, on our journey we also realize now that we, that we actually need to, to move on. And obviously we cannot forget that we had a financial crisis, and uh, following the crisis, there seems to be a general agreement that, uh, that a longer-term view is needed, that we need to actually stay away from a one-dimensional view of performance, that we need to stay away from, uh, from, uh, from short-term thinking, and, and therefore need a, a broader view of companies' performance. Uh, not only, uh, but importantly, uh, ESG factors, but also, I think, more broadly, operational metrics, such as how you're dealing with your customers, how you're dealing with your suppliers, how you're dealing with your, your IP. All very important. So that, that broader view is needed, and I think, uh, in particular, the investor community, but also the broader stakeholder community, is really asking that from, from companies in a, in, a, in, a, in a world that is really changing very rapidly, whether it's the, the geopolitical instability, whether it is the, the challenges of, uh, of the climate, uh, whether it is the, uh, the challenge of uh, digitalization. I say challenges, but clearly also opportunities. But uh, we need to address those. So I think... It's absolutely right that the EU, uh, in its leadership role, has always said that uh, um, reporting is very important from a wider po public policy perspective. That was true for IFRS, and it is also now the case for the wider corporate reporting agenda. Um, the NFI directive was a great step forward. Um, we'll hear, we have one of the architects here in, in our midst uh, from the, the NFI directive, uh, Richard Howard, who will speak later. Um, and that's where Europe was again taking a lead, but uh, still more is also needed. We're not there yet. And I think that's also acknowledged in the uh, Sustainable Finance Action Plan, that's acknowledged in the EC Fitness Check, that more is needed. Um, as many as you know, I'm also uh, connected to Accountancy Europe. And in Accountancy Europe, we started a debate a few years ago about the future of corporate reporting. And uh, um, also there, we concluded, really, uh, one of our key recommendations was that we need more innovation. And that uh, in order to create innovation, you also have to allow for experimentation. And I think that's uh, what uh, uh, the, the European Reporting Lab is really set up uh, to do. And so today's discussion should really uh, also be about how do we make that happen. So personally, very pleased that EFREG as an organization has taken on this, this broader role. Um, and we will hear more from uh, Jean-Paul Gosses, the, uh, the president of EFREC and also the chair of the, the, corporate rep or the uh, reporting lab's uh, steering group about the lab's agenda. As, a, as a, also a, a practitioner, uh, I've also learned that a lot of, uh, of innovation really comes from doing in practice. And a lot of innovation is actually taking place in, in, the, in the marketplace. 
and that's also what we uh, what we see happening. There's a, a, a growing number of companies in Europe and and around the world that are already using um, frameworks like integrated reporting framework in order to uh, to uh, on a voluntary basis, uh, but very often also urged on by the user community, very uh, often urged on by regulators, um, really to experiment and to establish good practice as we speak. And uh, Richard Howard, the, uh, the IRC CEO, will also tell us a bit more about the progress making, in, in, I assume, Richard, uh, in, in, in that space. Um, some companies go even further. Uh, we saw that some companies are now combining uh, integrated reporting with uh, Accountants for Europe's concept of core and more. We have uh, Massimo, uh, we'll talk about that uh, and from the perspective of Generali. We also see that uh, auditors are experimenting with integrated assurance over um, uh, you know, a broader set of, uh, of financial performance metrics, including integrated reporting. Uh, and uh, Nancy Kampuland, who will be sharing one of our uh, panels later this afternoon, uh, was, act was actually involved in, in providing that in, in a Dutch context. So. We have a lot of, uh, to talk about today, and, uh, and I think the central theme is innovation and, uh, and expectations. So two panels this afternoon will uh, we'll cover both the, uh, the opportunities and, uh, and, and the challenges. So uh, that's uh, the, the, the program for this, this afternoon. Um, two housekeeping uh, comments, and I'm looking at, uh, I don't know where Saskia is, but... Uh, um, are you there? You, gi you give me a sign when the, when the commissioner has arrived. But uh, um, two uh, two uh, um, housekeeping uh, uh, comments. One is, first of all, in terms of the papers for this uh, for this uh, event, you won't have received any, and that's deliberate, because Efrec uh, uh, wanted to make a very small contribution to sustainability by just only distributing these by email and not printing them out. So you can find them on the website, and uh, they have been sent by email. Now, the other important thing for this afternoon, we want uh, today to be really interactive. Um, and uh, therefore, we are going to use uh, the Slido app. I hope that everyone has heard of the Slido app. But if you ha not actually have, can you please go to your mobile phone now and uh, go to the App Store. And then if you type in sli.do, do, you should be able to, to download the app. And with the, uh, the, the Slido app, we can, uh, you will be able to ask questions this afternoon. So whenever you have a, a burning question for any of our speakers, uh, you know, please post it uh, uh, through the, the Slido app. And then other people in the room can actually like your, uh, your question. And as your question gets more liked, you know, the more chance you have that it actually will also be picked up because it will appear at the top of the page. Uh, and secondly, we have in the panels a number of, uh, of polling questions that we will put to you, and also the voting for the, uh, for the polling questions uh, are actually um, going to be through the, uh, through the Slido text. Um, that was actually, I think, most of the points that I had to raise. Uh, Saskia, I don't know. Um, no, we, we, sorry, we're going to actually do a test with the Slido. Another five minutes, so I'll slow it down a bit, and maybe we ask uh, <laughs> we ask uh, another four or five questions then, right? Uh, <laughs> so here you go. We're going to see uh, uh, whether everyone is now connected to the uh, to the uh, the Slido app. The first question is: Why did you decide to join this event today? Networking opportunities, knowledge building, speaker lineup. I like the one uh, my boss made me. The speaker line of my boss made me. So let's wait. We have only three people at the moment who have voted, so there must be a few more to come online. It will take five minutes for that. Yeah, we're already on a, on a count of 11. Mm -hmm. 
So just leave it open for a while because it would be good if we could get, you know, for each of the questions to at least 50 people, right? That would be nice. So let's see whether we can get a bit higher. We're now on 27. Okay. Shall we try one, one more question, uh, Lina? Yeah, shall we? Uh, so if we close this one, again, here a reminder of how you connect, and we do, uh, we do one more test question. That's the question we had. We have a little technology problem. In the age of innovation, we have a... <laughs> the internet is not working. So we may have crashed the, uh, the Wi-Fi. <laughs>
Good virtue, I've always learned. So uh, with a bit of patience, we, uh, we got it sorted. The, uh, the Wi-Fi is up. So here's the, the second question, uh, asking about your professional background. So hopefully we can get, uh, we get the numbers up already. It's now up to 38, where for respond. Let's see whether we can actually get a, an even higher score. Not working. <laughs> okay, well, we have uh, about, well, it's slightly less than half the room for, who, for, for whom it is working. Yeah. And the, uh, I, I just been told that the, uh, the, the vice president has arrived, so. Uh, yeah. So then we can uh, we can start with uh, with our agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, we are really uh, we are delighted to uh, to be joined today by uh, by Vice President uh, uh, Nombrovskis. Vice President, welcome. Um, just by, by way of introduction, uh, Vice President uh, Dombrovskis uh, is within the Commission, uh, responsible for the, the euro and for social dialogue, but also in charge of financial stability, uh, financial services, and the uh, the capital markets union. And uh, prior to becoming uh, the EC's uh, vice president, he served for three consecutive terms as the uh, prime minister of Latvia. So with this short introduction, uh, vice president, I would like to give the floor to you. Please welcome vice president Dombrovski. Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen. It's a pleasure to be uh, here uh, to open the first conference of the European uh, Corporate Reporting Laboratory. Uh, and uh, thank, uh, thanks uh, to EFRAG for this uh, invitation. Uh, I would like to take this occasion uh, to uh, congratulate all the members of Lab Steering Group uh, and the first project task, uh, uh, project task force on climate-related uh, reporting for your appointments. Uh, we are uh, grateful you for your uh, willingness uh, to share your time and your expertise. And I would like to thank EFRAG for enabling the lab to become operational efficiently and on time. Uh, uh, there is indeed no time to lose when it comes to climate change and other sustainability crises that we face. Uh, the coming decade will be uh, decisive uh, for the plate of this uh, planet as we know it. Uh, we already are seeing the consequences of one degree uh, global warming. And unless we accelerate transition to low carbon economy uh, now, we might lock ourselves into catastrophic climate change. Uh, the EU is uh, committed to implementing Paris Agreement and leading the global fight against climate change, but the public sector alone cannot move uh, mountains. Uh, we need more private investment to scale up renewable energy, uh, develop options for storing surplus energy and decarbonize our economy. And we need to rethink the way the financial system approaches sustainability, transparency, and long-term risks. Uh, this is why last uh, spring we put forward a 10 points action plan to scale up sustainable finance, followed by three legislative proposals. Uh, our uh, first proposal was to create a, an EU classification system for sustainable uh, economic activities, known as uh, taxonomy. This will help investors and companies to better understand what is green and sustainable. 
And our technical expert group on uh, sustainable finance is uh, currently uh, preparing the substance of taxonomy uh, so it can be ready by the time the regulation is adopted. Uh, then uh, we proposed to give climate conscious investors better tools to measure their performance by setting EU standards for low carbon benchmarks. And I'm pleased that we recently concluded negotiations with the European Parliament and a Council on this proposal. Uh, finally, we propose that investment managers should uh, disclose how they take sustainability issues into account. Uh, in addition, those investment managers that market their products as sustainable will have to disclose how they achieve those objectives. Uh, on this uh, proposal, negotiations are currently ongoing for a deal at the EU level, and I uh, call on the both co-legislators uh, to reach agreement still before the end of this uh, mandate, before European Parliament elections. Uh, all three of these legislative proposals depend on some uh, extra uh, 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 good, uh, uh, some to, to, to some extent, on good ex uh, disclosure on non financial information by companies. Uh, this is uh, why, uh, where uh, there is an important part of our action plan that is uh, devoted to uh, corporate uh, disclosure. So now let me uh, turn on to this. Uh, not so long ago, a company's uh, corporate social responsibility uh, was uh, mainly a marketing tool. Uh, it was often strong on nice uh, photos, but not on much else. Company birds were not very concerned about the uh, content, and mainstream investors took little notice. However, uh, uh, with the urgency of climate change, uh, we uh, see this all is uh, changing very rapidly. Uh, Non-financial reporting is moving from the margins to the mainstream. Uh, this can be seen, for example, in the attitudes of national supervisors. Uh, last year, the Swedish financial market supervisor pointed out that only around one-third of companies have clear routines for identifying and managing sustainability-related risks. And according to the recent analysis by Dutch financial market supervisor, uh, company reporting on the risks and opportunities of climate change is still minimal and needs to be accelerated. Uh, we also see this change in attitude among central bankers of the G20 countries. Um, uh, uh, they were the ones who established the Financial Stability Board Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, uh, thanks to the non-financial reporting directive, the EU is, uh, uh, already has a head start in this area. Uh, this directive requires large companies, banks and insurance uh, uh, companies uh, to disclose uh, material environmental risks and how they are managed. It both anticipated and uh, accelerated the move of uh, sustainability reporting from the margins to the mainstream. And we have uh, one of the architects of this uh, directive uh, here uh, today, uh, Mr. Richard Hovett. Uh, one of the most uh, innovative aspects of this directive is its dual perspective on the reporting of sustainability issues. Uh, one perspective is, of course, how the company is impacted by risks and opportunities related to sustainability issues, such as climate or, uh, 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 climate or uh, human rights. But the directive also takes into account uh, the uh, second perspective, namely uh, the impact that company has on those issues. Uh, in the history of corporate reporting, uh, this was uh, quite a radical idea. And as a new laboratory starts its work on innovations on corporate sustainability reporting, it's uh, worth keeping that double perspective in mind. Uh, it is uh, especially interesting to note that these two perspectives are not uh, always so uh, separate after all. Uh, a company that has significant negative impacts on the environment or on society should expect sooner or later to see that uh, translate into financial risks and costs. And a company that helps to solve sustainability issues should see financial reward provided we get the supporting policies right. Uh, many leading European companies understand that, and uh, this is where the role of the European Reporting Laboratory comes in. Uh, we want you to help identify the good, innovative reporting practices of leading companies and to help spread such practices. Uh, in parallel, the Commission will be working full speed to uh, improve corporate disclosure of climate change risks. 
uh, already companies are filling out many different uh, different sustainability surveys but despite their efforts uh, invo uh, investors often say they lack uh, the high, le high quality information they need to adopt climate friendly investment principles uh, this is why the Commission will update its non-binding guidelines uh, to integrate the recommendations of the FSB Task Force on Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. Uh, this should help companies disclose climate information in a more consistent and comparable manner. And in line with the Non-Financial Reporting Directive, these guidelines will go also one step further uh, uh, than the Task Force. Uh, the new guidelines will not only look at how the clim climate affects companies, but also how companies affect the climate. Uh, two weeks ago, the Commission published the draft guidelines on uh, climate-related reporting for online consultation. So I encourage uh, uh, all of you to respond uh, to this. Uh, we intend to publish the final version of those guidelines by uh, summer, uh, together with a fitness check on the overall framework for corporate reporting in Europe. The fitness check, uh, check will be the first opportunity to take stock of the impact of non-financial reporting directive. Uh, it is uh, then uh, uh, will be for the next commission to look at the evidence and uh, to uh, decide whether to propose the revision of the directive. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me conclude. Uh, making the financial sector more sustainable will be a core part of your work and it has become an important part of uh, uh, my work. Uh, with the European Corporate Reporting uh, uh, Lab, we will help companies and investors to seize the opportunities of the low-carbon transition and you will help them to work for the benefit of society, the climate and the environment. So I wish you all the success in this important uh, venture and uh, look forward to seeing the results. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Vice President Dombrovsky. I think uh, the... Uh, um, you know, the, as I already said in my opening remarks, the fact that, that Europe is taking a, a leadership here is, is, is very much welcome. Now, next we're going to talk about the, uh, uh, the, the European reporting lab itself, and I'm very pleased to uh, uh, introduce uh, uh, a man who doesn't need a lot of introduction. I think uh, Jean Paul Gosses, uh, who is the president of EFREC, but also the uh, the chair of the uh, European Reporting Lab, uh, Steer uh, lab Steering Committee. And uh, Jean-Paul was a, uh, an MEP from 2004 until 2014 um, and has now actually moved on to reporting. And uh, maybe I should say now, I see there's a bit of a trend going because we have Richard Howard later and we have Hans Hogevoss. I think reporting is really an interesting space for, for politicians, you know, to have a follow-up on their career. So, uh, Jean-Paul, with that, I give the floor to you. Thank yes. you. Thanks, Mark, for your kind introduction. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Dear Richard, former MEP. I am very pleased to welcome you all to this conference on the role of innovation in corporate reporting. First of all, I want to thank Vice President Dombrovsky, in charge of Euro and social dialogue, also in charge of financial stability, financial services, and Capital Markets Union for his encouraging address and messages for all of us. This sets the scene for our discussion today and gives us food for thought. Today's conference will over cover both the realities and challenges of today's corporate reporting. It covers also matters related to the future of corporate reporting influenced by current innovations. One of the themes that will be discussed is to, it's today, in today's conference with implications for innovation is the expected role of the newly established European Reporting Lab at EFRAG. The European Reporting Lab was established at the request of the European Commission in its March 2018 action plan on financing sustainable growth. It is not surprising that a rethink 
of the role of effectiveness of corporate reporting is being considered as one of the pillars of the action plan. Availing corporate reporting information can influence the behaviors of companies. The quality of reporting information may also influence the willingness of financial capital providers to fund the objectives of the action plan. We very much welcome that the European Commission has asked EFRA to set up the European Reporting Lab. The establishment of the lab at EFRA is a recognition that EFRA has a broader role to play beyond its traditional area of focus on financial reporting. EFRA is well known for its role in contributing to the development of IFRS standards, its research activities, and its endorsement advice on IFRS standards to the Commission. After all, financial reporting is a crucial and important pillar of corporate reporting. Financial reporting needs to fit into the larger context of corporate reporting. IFRS must evolve to remain relevant as changes take place in the wider corporate reporting environment. With the European Reporting Lab, EFRA will now have an enhanced role in broader corporate reporting. The establishment of the European Lab is also responsive to the call from stakeholders where we respond to the 2017 perception audit of EFRA. Our stakeholders encourage EFRA to increase the scope of its work to include issues relating to wider corporate reporting, technology developments more broadly, and within financial reporting, non-financial reporting, and sustainable finance. The main objective of the European Reporting Lab is to stimulate innovation in the field of corporate reporting in Europe and by identifying and sharing good practices. I want to underline that the European Lab will not prepare guidance or issue any official positions and should not be seen or interpreted as being a first step to any follow-up legislations. Identifying examples of good pra reporting practices has the potential to encourage more wider spread, high quality reporting on a voluntary basis and without the need for changing the mandatory reporting requirements. The European Reporting Lab was formally established in September following the approval of the governance documents by the EFRA General Assembly. The European Lab consists of a European Lab Steering Group and Project Task Forces for each project the, Europe, the European Lab will undertake. I am sharing the steering group and Alain Deckers in his capacity as head of the accounting and financial reporting unit at DG FISMA is a vice chair. The European Lab Steering consists of 15 experts and through leaders in broader corporate reporting. They will have diverse professional and geographic background. The steering group members were appointed by the EFRA General Assembly in November 2018 and selected after a very competitive process that attracted nearly 18 eight quality applicants. The steering group decided on the agenda of the European Lab, appoint the project task force oversee the work of project task force and review progress of the European Lab. So far, the steering group has had two meetings. The first was held at the end of November. The second was held this morning. At its first meeting in November, the steering group confirmed the first European reporting land project will be on climate-related reporting. This is consistent with the goal made by the European Commission in its action plan. At the first meeting, the steering group also decided that the high-level objectives of the first project will be to assess the current state of climate-related reporting by European companies. Another broad objective will be to assess the current and potential use of climate-related reporting information by investors and other users. It was also decided that the primary focus on the climate reporting project 
will be on the TSFD recommendations. This is, of course, without overlooking other relevant reporting frameworks. In the meeting held this morning, the discussion by the steering group was mainly around possible future projects. The European Lab Steering Group will agree on a short list of possible future projects. A public consultation of the future agenda of the European Lab is planned to take place in the second half of this year. A public consultation provides an opportunity for the stakeholders that are not directly, directly involved in the work of the European Reporting Lab to contribute their, their perspective. A public consultation can also help to ensure that resources are dedicated to the projects European stakeholders believe should have the highest priority. We hope you will all provide input to any future consultation on the work of the European Lab. I'm also happy to announce that we have appointed the Climate Related Reporting Project Task Force. This was done after a call for candidates that attracted 62 applicants. The project task force consists of 23 experts with diverse professional and national backgrounds. The project task force is shared by Michel Lacroix. Michel is also a member of the technical expert group on sustainability finance. The project task force had its first meeting last week to decide on the detailed scope and projection plan. We have set an ambitious time schedule and have asked the project task force to do its work in a time frame of one year. I would also note that the project task force will outreach to wider stakeholders during its work. Here again, your insight and expertise will be very valuable. We will call up you. As you can see, the European Reporting Lab is now operational and the artwork has begun. I am proud to say that we have met the timetable in the European Commission's action plan. I recognize that there are many ways of addressing innovation and that there are many other initiatives that are also looking at how to stimulate innovation in corporate reporting. Today will give us, without doubt, further insights in these initiatives. I hope that with the benefits of practical insight and expertise at our disposal within the steering group and project task force, the European Reporting Lab should be able to make a unique contribution. I hope the European Reporting Lab will be an important building block for innovation in European corporate reporting. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, Jean-Paul. And I must say it's really encouraging you know, to, to hear that so many people want to get involved in these initiatives. If you only know, uh, mentioned the number of applicable, uh, applicants that are willing to take a role in the new lab, I think that is extremely encouraging and also shows how many people uh, are really bought into this agenda. So I think that is, uh, that's great. Um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, our next uh, speaker. Uh, his name has already been mentioned a few times, uh, Richard Howard. Richard, uh, uh, welcome back to, uh, to Brussels. Um, as, as mentioned, he was a, uh, Richard was an a MEP for many years, over 20 years, I think, uh, Richard, uh, you were in, in the European Parliament, uh, but now has taken on the role as the uh, Chief Executive Officer of the IRC, the integrated, uh, International Integrated Reporting Council. And uh, Richard, um, may I invite you to the stage? The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, dear Jean-Paul. Uh, dear Mark, I forgive you for that joke earlier. Where are you? I forgive you for that joke. Um, by the way, as, as one of the keynote speakers, it was great to see the Slido uh, result. The, the thing that m least got you to come to this meeting was the quality of the speakers. <laughs> That's really encouraging. Um, uh, Dear Andrew and Saskia, it is a complete honour to be asked to join with you, Jean-Paul, in launching this 
laboratory. Thank you so much for asking me to do it. And this is a shared journey for us and for many of us in this room. And I truly believe that today is an exciting day in the history of what we're trying to do and that you have such a major contribution uh, as we change corporate reporting in the world. Uh, and it is a privilege to be, to be asked to, to take part. And I'm just going to perhaps ask for some help with this, if it, as it's not working. Could one of the techniques at the back help me in terms of the slides? Thank you. So firstly, the directive. It's been talked about a lot, and I'm not going to talk about it in detail. Um, uh, and by the way, it's terribly flattering people said what they said, but the truth is many of us delivered that directive, and I always say I take responsibility of all the bad things about it and none of the credit for the good things. But I think that the fact that the directive was passed shows that we can achieve real change. I remember it was a 10-year journey to get the directive passed, and when we first floated the idea people said this is just never going to happen and yet here it is today and last year probably between 10 and 12,000 different companies produced non-financial reports for the first time. Uh, vast majority saying that they thought environmental and social impact was important, 90% saying that human rights was important to them. Are they perfect reports? Is that the end of the story? Of course not. It's a learning exercise. I know only a fraction of those will have done integrated reports in the first year. I do think that's going to go up year by year as a learning exercise. I think the, the think tank, Frank Bold, who are in the audience, produced a very interesting report recently. Uh, and one of the things it said is it wanted focus on business model and the linkages to business model and integrated reporting will be part of the next phase. So I think there is some learning to do in relation uh, to all of that. But the very fact that we have pioneered this major change of corporate reporting in Europe and it's happening today in real form and is irreversible, I think shows that we can achieve real change. And I think that's the lesson for the forward programme and the future of the reporting lab, uh, that what we and you deliberate on really can happen. Now, I've got three simple messages in my address to you today. Firstly, Reporting does have to change. Financial reporting does have to change. It's not broken. It's not failed. But unless it changes, it will. And I want to actually, it's been said already by you, Jean-Paul, and others, but I want to actually sketch out the reasons beneath that so that we can fundamentally share our analysis, which leads us to that conclusion. Secondly, I want to show you why a laboratory is the right way of doing it. It's not the only answer, but it's a key way that we can get to the right answers. And I want to actually sketch out the, argu the, the argument beneath that. And my friend and colleague Olivier from Accountancy Europe, he and they and we lobbied for a reporting laboratory to be part of the next phase. And, uh, you know, I want to say how pleased we are about that but also why we did that and what hopes I have and Olivier will be speaking later in terms of uh, what it can achieve and finally I do want to conclude how that comes back to the EU agenda we've heard from Vice President Dombrovskis but this isn't thinking that will come forward that may or may not make a difference it will make a difference it can make a difference and i think we've heard that already and i want to reinforce that on how i see that coming back in terms of the future eu agenda now why firstly then why does reporting have to change i'm still looking for a bit of help from my friend okay just a, a small a small uh, time uh, lapse thank you firstly the financial crisis blindingly obvious but let's be careful about not forgetting the lessons of the financial crisis. And what it showed us is that you cannot insulate the company or the organisation from the wider system. The idea that you can um, just pass on the risk to someone else completely has gone out the window after the financial crisis. And it was a crisis made 
from a culture and a mindset of excessive short-termism. And unless we are prepared to address the culture which says that we should be not pursuing long-termism at the expense of the short-term, which some want or say they want, but recognise that we have to work across multiple time frames and that, that we cannot be excessively short-term in our planning, then we will simply move towards global financial crisis too, which indeed some predict. And it was a crisis that started in America, but it was a series of banks across Europe, including Banco Espirito Santo, Anglo Irish Bank, Royal Bank of Scotland. And we have seen, before, then, and after, a series of audit failures. Let's say that we do see that and recognise that. Of course, Carillion in the UK is top of mind for many, but Pescanova in Spain was a, another high-profile case in the last years and in the rest of the world. Olympus, uh, I was in Australia last year in the Royal Banking Commission, they're coming forward after a string of banking failures in that country. Audit has also too often failed, and therefore the way that we undertake financial reporting is being questioned. It is being questioned and has to change in its own right as well before you bring in any other sense of uh, the need to report. The second clear argument, and again, I think this is very well known, so I can do it briefly, but it is the rise of the value in intangible assets, and the Ocean Tomo is the leading research organisation in this respect, and everyone's heard this before, and I apologise if you have, but it's a, a bitter truth that has to be repeated, which is financial reporting today is doing better at better at measuring a smaller and smaller amount of what actually values in the company. And therefore, 30 years ago, yes, 80% of the value of the company was intangible assets in the factory, in the equipment, and the stocks, things you could pick up and hold. And 20% was in intangible assets. And 30 years later, it's completely flipped, and 80% is in the intangible assets, and only 20% in the tangibles. And whether we move on and talk about the, the capitals of integrated reporting, which I will do in a moment, but whether it's brand whether it's reputation, uh, whether it's culture within the organisation, everyone across business now would accept that, that, that value is in, the, in these intangibles and it's not picked up in reporting as we see it today. By the way, that slide I first used, or was first used in 2015, that's gone up. So in the two subsequent reports Ocean Tomo has done, the value of intangibles is 84% and now 87%. So it's continuing to rise and that's why we cannot focus simply on financial reporting. Next, we have confusion in the market. This is the, we have about 10,000 stakeholders that are associated with the International Integrated Reporting Council. And we survey them um, every year. And there is confusion out there. People know, organisations, businesses know that something's got to change, but they're not quite sure what, and they're confused about how to do it. And, you know, part of the aims of having a global international integrated reporting council is to help bring clarity to the landscape. And what can enable us to achieve that? The top three results. First of all, we don't say this can be done only by regulation. We don't say that. But we do say that regulators have a key role in signposting, educating, endorsing these approaches to help us bring clarity to the landscape. And that's why we welcome the, the relationship with Alan and all of the Commission colleagues who have a big role here to support the education, the signposting uh, that takes place within Europe itself. Secondly is higher awareness. People are, they know there's something there, but they're stuck in the short-termism. And so they have to... We have to help people be more aware in terms of enabling there to be clarity in moving forward. And thirdly, the lab, greater tools and guidance. People need to be helped to have, find it easier to move to a new, a different type of reporting model. Next, we have to remember that reporting is never just for itself. Why do we report? Why we report? is for better capital markets, better business, better society. And this is just about the impact on the capital markets. Each of those arrows represents something that we can do better, 
I won't read, the, read them through. But the outcome of it is not simply a better report. The outcome is better investor confidence, better longer-term investment, more economic success, better information, better transparency. I did read them. But these are the reasons behind why we want better reporting. It isn't a sort of elegant exercise in its own right. It's achieving system change, and, that's, uh, and we should keep focus on that. And then we should understand that this isn't a new argument. Sometimes we all, we all like to be at the start of something and to present this as a new argument. But in reality, this is a, a report that FRAG itself produced a little over a decade ago uh, in response to a consultation by the ASB uh, um, uh, and where, the, where FRAG itself argued that a key aim of financial reporting should be stewardship and accountability. And so the idea that we have to change financial reporting, we have to look at the boundaries, we have to have a different mindset as we address it, is not new. It's something that's been thought about, including by the actors in this room, for some years. And it is our role now to take that to the next stage. And then reporting is changing because information is changing. This is the IRC's Tap and Lake diagram. Um, it's simply an analogy which says that reporting in the past was that tap on the left-hand side, which a company once a year turned on, the information came out, it turned off again, wait for a year. But in the new era of big data and artificial intelligence and technological revolution, information will come about the company from multiple streams, multiple sources, to form a lake in which investors and others will test the information, whether it comes from the tap of the company or not. And therefore, reporting will change in that environment. It's a moving target. And that's why we think the principles are based approach, which is, the work, which is part of the philosophy of integrated reporting, is a really important way of dealing with this. If we simply try to say it can all be done by taxonomies, we're going to quickly find that whatever we come up with is out of date because technology has forced it to do so, and therefore not losing sight of the principles-based approach is an important, important part of how we go forward. Now, how are we changing that? We, firstly, we're moving to the idea of a multi-capital approach. So whether you call it the capitals or not, actually the, the Inter International Integrated Reporting Council doesn't greatly mind. But the idea that there are multiple capitals, sorry, this slide again is slightly slow, and I apologise, there we go. Um, uh, uh, the idea that there are multiple capitals, multiple resources and relationships on which the company, the economy, uh, organisations rely, and that each of those interrelate with each other, there are trade-offs between them, that none of them actually are free goods, that they represent flows which you can deplete and which you can add to, and some in relation to the natural capital, there are clear planetary boundaries in relationship to. This is the new world and the, and the new mindset in which businesses operate. And many of you will know this very uh, well, but financial and manufactured capital have been the stuff of financial reporting down all of the years. But human capital, people, social and relationship, capital, society, intellectual capital ideas, and of course natural capital, the environment, are the new multi-capital approaches which are important as we drive forward. And we've established integrated reporting, not as a separate form of reporting, additional, not replacing uh, anything. It's a set of principles that we hope and expect to guide mainstream corporate reporting within less than a decade, which says that you take each of those different capitals on the left-hand side and you look at how those input into the business and then you look at what the business does, its model, its strategy, and then you look at the outputs from that, as you always do in terms of reporting, but the outcomes for the business, the outcomes in relation to financial capital, but the outcomes in relation to the multi-capital view. And that, in essence, is the principles of integrated reporting. If you've not seen it before, it's known as the famous octopus diagram. 
And I do do a joke about octopuses, but that's for after dinner speeches, not for the, this afternoon. So you'll have to hear that one on another occasion. And to demonstrate that this is not some sort of alternative or different or competing or proliferating initiative, but one which is genuinely providing a convening space to draw it together, is the fact that we set up the corporate reporting dialogue in which the two major financial standard setters in the world, the ISB, but also its US equivalent, FASB, and what we regard as the four most comprehensive and global frameworks working in the non-financial or sustainability space. And my good friend and colleague, Marty McBrien, is uh, in the front from CDSB, who is a huge supporter of this. And Bastian is here from the GRI, but Tim Moen uh, is also um, intrinsically, uh, has been intrinsically involved in getting us to this. We have now not simply formed a dialogue which together is committed to bringing consistency, coherence and comparability to reporting at the global level, now meeting over three years, common landscape map, common founding principle of materiality, common um, uh, analysis on how this affects business behaviour, it's not reporting for itself, and common position paper with investors on what investors want from reporting, common position paper published only last week on business reporting of the SDGs. Very, very good signs that we are bringing reporting together. But also, in November, Marty and I, uh, in a rather bizarre um, uh, uh, event that took place at a funny time in the Southern Hemisphere, but across two different hemispheres around the world, we jointly launched an alignment project in which all of the members of the Corporate Reporting Dialogue have committed to aligning metrics, not one framework, but within two years, many common metrics across the different across the different frameworks with the first um, phase of that being published as soon as September this year and the work is going on there. So open consultation about that. Normally we come to conferences in Brussels and hear about consultations from the Commission. This is a consultation from us in which everyone is able to, to participate. But it's a real sign that we are bringing the corporate landscape together and we've created the ability to work together in order to be able to do it. And the final reason why reporting has to change is in these two books, published, I think, in the same year. The one on the left-hand side says the end of accounting, and the one on the right-hand side says accountants can save the world. Now, the more, it's an erudite audience, this, so you might have actually thought to yourself, well, perhaps both can't be right. But... It is true. Barrett Love and um, Professor Gu in the States basically say that investors are increasingly not using financial reporting at all. I don't actually buy their total analysis, but it's a challenge, and it's a good challenge for all of us. But Professor Judge Mervyn King, the founding chair of the International Integrated Reporting Council, wrote his book saying accountants will save the world. And in essence... We have to make the right-hand side true and the left-hand side not. And I believe that we are up to the task. Now, I said that I wanted to say a second thing about why it's important to have a lab and a learning approach and innovation and experimentation. And a key part of that is the principle of agile management. Many of you will know this, so we can say it very quickly. But the old way that we solved problems, the old linear way, you had a problem, you analysed it and came up with a solution, is gone in this new era, the multi-capital era, the long-term era. The principle of agile management is a Copernican revolution, as the slide says, in which the Earth is not in the centre of the universe with the sun going round it, the firm is not in the middle of the universe with everyone else going round it, but everyone else is in the middle and the firm has to adapt and change constantly in terms of that Copernican revolution. And experimentation, innovation, you could say that the laboratory is doing research and development about corporate reporting. This is what is needed in terms of developing the solutions that we need, not the old 
linear approach. We're also very attracted to this, uh, both Olivier and I, others as well, by the way, I'm not saying that exclusively. Um, we were very attracted to this because both of us had experience of the financial reporting lab in the United Kingdom, the one, by, one run by the Financial Reporting Council. And by the way, I will just say, uh, as a British national uh, at this point, we've already had one reference to, re to Theresa May. Um, uh, uh, and, by, and by the way, Andrew is a good friend and colleague, and I just want to pay tribute for everything that you've done from EFRAG. It's the right day for us to say that as well. Um, you know, whatever one's views and thoughts about all of that, I represent a global organisation. We've got others in the audience who are part of the council, including our, our friends at ACCA. We are global organisations who might be headquartered in London but are represented right around the world. And I would just want to say today on my own behalf, but I know they share it in others, that we are as committed to working with the EU in the next era, whatever happens, irrespective of what happens. It's a very, very important message for you to hear in terms of the, of the, uh, of the next steps. And, and drawing on that experience of the Financial Reporting Council in the UK, they have produced a series of reports, for example, on valuing blockchain, on valuing artificial intelligence, that I've learned and we've learned a lot from. And I believe the lab itself can do that learning right at the cutting edge in the, in the same way. And companies are reluctant to disclose if it means they think they're taking too great a risk. And these labs can create a safe space in which to explore different outcomes that companies are happy to engage with. And I think that can be a great thing that you can learn from and we can all learn from, from the FRC experience. And this isn't, of course, just that example. There's a really interesting experiment from our friends in Finland. I'm sure we've got some Finnish colleagues in the audience today uh, called Organising Experimental Finland, in which there's co-designed design of, of policy. We see from the Commission itself that the digital single market policy of the Commission has come forward with principles for self and co-regulation. So there are different models here, which are not the traditional Brussels models about how policy is made in the European Union, but which are increasingly coming in, partly because of the pressures of this new digital era. And the third reason why this lab approach is right is why we have integrated reporting. We have integrated reporting not as just a better report, but because there is a cycle of integrated reporting and integrated thinking. Many of you, again, were going to be very familiar with this. And that organisations and companies who use integrated reporting, it's not just about the disclosure, and it's not primarily for the regulator. It is about long-term value creation for the company or for the organisation with this broader definition of value. And it's about then using that information in terms of the strategy and the management, good governance of the company. And that's what integrated thinking is, thinking not in the excessive short term finance only, but being able to think about the multiple capitals, think in the long term as well as the short term, and frankly in financial reporting, to think to the future and not just to the past or to the very near future. That's what integrated thinking is. And that's a key component that we are challenging business, we're challenging the world to change a mindset. And the lab itself can be an important part by the mindset that you and we adopt in order to be able to achieve that approach. And in the last part of what I want to say, this will actually make a difference. The directive on the left-hand side there, We've got revised guidelines we've already heard about from Vice President Dombrovskis. The accountancy directive will itself be reviewed and amended next year. This is an opportunity to build in some of the principles we're talking about, for me, the principles of integrated reporting and thinking, overtly into those revisions. We've seen the high-level expert group on sustainable development uh, sustainable Finance and the Sustainable Finance Action Plan of the Commission. Commissioner de Morris has been very clear about that. The high-level group said integrated reporting was, quote, the ultimate ambition, unquote. So we recognise it's not the answer to everything, but it's a completely key tool to deliver that action plan, and we 
accept that. The guidelines I've referred to already, but often missed out off this list is the work that the Commission itself is doing in relation to the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and disclosure, uh, information, transparency are key to us measuring the business contribution towards the SDGs. Uh, and in looking at the reflection paper of the European Commission on building a sustainable Europe by 2030, I see all of these coming together and the lab being able to contribute across the board and reporting, information, data being at the heart of all of them. So to the lab itself, I've got a couple of appeals and the quality of the people, by the way, on the steering group and on the project groups, fantastic. Many of them good friends and colleagues. Good luck to you all. And I'm not going to try and name you all because I definitely would miss someone off the list. But to the lab itself, I think it's sensible that climate and TCFD is the first project. Uh, we took the same view, didn't we, in relation to the alignment project. And so all of the frameworks will be, will ask the same questions around the TCFD by September this year. I think that's an ambitious plan, but we're going to do it, aren't we? Um, and I, I, I like that because TCFD, I see as a tipping point, which says this is a financial issue, not just an ecological and environment issue. And it comes from the Financial Stability Board. And I think that's a huge game changer as far as the mindset or the idea of integrated reporting and thinking is concerned. And I like it because actually if you look into the TCFD report, and a number of are on the committee here in, in Europe on the, its implementation, it actually says align different frameworks, don't invent a new one, take the ones that are there that are perfectly good and get them to align. And that was the challenge back to us uh, and one that we have embraced in the alignment project which we set up. So I think starting with climate and starting with the TCFD is sensible but it's only sensible if it doesn't stop there. It's only sensible if you join the dots up, if you understand how that can be integrated with financial reporting and begin to make the connections in a multi-capital world or multi-capital mentality. And that is a challenge for all of you involved in the first project uh, and in determining the, determining the, follow, uh, the projects that follow that I appeal to, to you to follow. We must end up with an integrated approach if this is going to reach the mainstream. And my second appeal to everyone involved in the lab is if you're involved in experimentation, you sort of you get a problem and you're working around and you come up with some answers and you can do some good work and you can feel proud of it and it can add to the whole, but is it enough? Given the size of the challenge, sustainable Europe by 2030, sustainable development goals, a complete change to a sustainable financial system, full integration with financial reporting. These are massive big challenges, big picture challenges for all of us. And we must be careful not to get involved in just incremental or iterative change. Of course, that's part of it. But we have to make sure that we, uh, that we support transformative change in what we do. And I hope all of you involved in whichever projects in this period will keep that challenge in your mind as we go forward. It's a great challenge. It's a great opportunity. And I wish you all very well in undertaking this task. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Richard. And uh, you're, you're very clear in, in what you're asking from the, uh, from the European lab. Um, let's now quickly move on to uh, the, the last session before we are going to have a, a, a short break. Uh, and that's uh, uh, going to look at uh, some of the uh, overcoming some of the challenges in corporate reporting. So we start with the, challenge, the challenges because we want to end up with uh, kind of the opportunities uh, uh, at the end. Uh, but uh, we also need to address what are the challenges. And I think you already mentioned a few, uh, uh, Richard, of the things that we need to address. So in this next panel, uh, we'll have uh, Nancy Kampuland, who I already mentioned. Uh, a dear colleague of mine of the, the Dutch Institute uh, and uh, uh, an associate partner at uh, EY, uh, where she's responsible for um, uh, non-financial reporting, um, and also only recently inaugurated as a professor at the University of Groningen, also dealing with uh, non-financial reporting, integrated reporting. Uh, Nancy is going to, to moderate the session, and Nancy, I think the deal is that you are going to introduce your own panel members. Just with this, I would like to invite you to the stage. Well, 
I think, I don't know whether my mic is on or, okay. First of all, I'm looking at myself, I was confronted end of the 80s with environmental pollution myself. I was an accountant, a financial auditor as background. And then I realized that financial statements was just not sufficient enough to provide the real picture of companies. And I started to advocate, let's call pol politicians in the Netherlands, but also start to write different guidances, both on reporting and assurance. So I'm very happy that now, after so many years, it really becomes into the mainstream. Uh, I think I, I had some things prepared, but I keep it brief because we need to go <laughs> in time to our break. But I do think that we need to consider uh, two different perspectives. One is that we have this accountability, and to what extent are we reporting based on accountability and business ethics? And, and if you looked at in the past, like I just mentioned this pollution, it would really come from the perspective of this business ethics. But on the other hand, there is also a lot of decision usefulness, the investment perspective. And to what extent does the information need to be sufficient for investors? And can we combine both uh, types of, of perspectives? Um, I, I don't want to take away my, my panel points of view. So um, I cut my, my own uh, speech and go to our excellent panel. Uh, and this panel is uh, considering of two speakers that come from a standard setting perspective. And I think the first one is Bastian, and Bastian is the Chief of Standards of Global Reporting Initiative. Uh, I think we have a Global Reporting Initiative since 1997, and Bastian led the introduction of the GRI standards, so the transition from guidelines to the standards from 2016. He also has a lot of stakeholder engagement. So can I ask you to join? Um, also, we have Marty, Marty McBride, already mentioned, and she is the Managing Director of the Carbon Disclosure Standards Board, and she describes herself as enjoying this challenge of working with companies, investors, regulators across the world to drive mainstream reporting. Marty, <coughs> can I ask you to sit down? Uh, I think very important is to have the user perspective and we are very happy that Claudia Cruz, who is the Managing Director, Global Responsible Investment and Governance at, at APG, uh, that manages over 450 billion assets under management on behalf of Dutch pension funds, is willing to join our panel. Claudia, can I ask you to join the panel? <coughs> And, of course, the preparer side is of importance. And from the preparer side, we are very glad to have Roman, Massimo Romano. And he is the project leader of implementing a non-financial disclosure directive at the Generali Group. And, uh, he, but he also uh, co-chaired the Insurance Business Network of the IRC. And uh, he is a member of the ASB's Management Commentary Consultative Group. So I'm really very happy with this knowledge. And then I'm going to the audience for my question to the audience. And that's the Slido question. And I really hope that our internet is working right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. What is your extent of involvement with non-financial information? And I don't know whether the Slido is on your screens of your phones. Okay. Otherwise, I just skip this question. Is it on? Do you have it on your phones or not? Yeah? So significant, moderate, not significant or none. <laughs> Sorry. Can anyone from the uh, can 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 give you can you give me the answer? Do you have it on screen? Yeah.
So I'm really very happy that we have this, the largest number is significant involvement with non-financial information, which is very encouraging. Um, I'm immediately moving back to my panel. Um, and with the first question, what are the challenging challenges faced in implementing non-financial reporting requirements? And if we talk about the challenges, maybe you can also briefly elaborate what in your, your view should be done to overcome those challenges. And Massimo, from a preparer side, because you face those challenges primarily. May I ask you to briefly yes. reflect on that? Thank you, Nancy. Um, I joined General in 1996 and I've always been working in finance. Uh, so uh, in the last years, I've seen uh, things uh, you people in finance wouldn't believe. Uh, because the evolution of the corporate reporting uh, has been amazing uh, in the last years uh, and uh, more will come. Um, I want to share with you my experience uh, uh, as a project leader of the implementation of non-financial disclosure in my, in my group. Um, and I, I want to share the challenges uh, uh, divided in three main groups. Uh, the who, the what, uh, and the how group. Well, first, uh, the who group of challenges. And here I'm, I'm referring to the role of the board of directors and more generally the, um, the silos approach that many organizations are, are facing nowadays. So I think here the solution is uh, integrity thinking, as uh, uh, Richard said, because uh, you have to involve uh, all the stakeholders internally, starting from the board members, um, not just at the, big, at, the, at, the, at the end of the process for the approval of the non-financial disclosure, for instance, but systematically. And uh, my experience in the last two years with the, with the board and with the different committees, sustainability and risk uh, uh, committees in particular, was really amazing. Um, first of all, we started with the awareness phase, and now we are in the challenges phase. So we are bringing really good value from, from them in order to improve our, our disclosure. And what are your key challenges, Massimo, then, if you are now in your challenges phase? Well, it, it's a journey. It, it's a journey, and it's a journey based on the strategy. So the strategy is evolving, and the, the board, uh, the board members, are, are challenges the top management on these on these layers. Um, the second challenge uh, is the the what, and in particular uh, here the materiality mm -hmm. uh, analysis. I think is one of the most critical element, and the second one is the KPIs. Yeah. Um, many times we tend to forget the key in the KPI and we just uh, disclose performance indicators. Um, just to be a little bit provocative here, in the non-binding uh, guidelines, uh, I see maybe a lot of uh, performance indicators. I'm not so sure that all of them are key performance indicators. So here I think that materiality and uh, the relevant KPIs, it's really the big, the big challenge, solution, Strategy first, uh, you have to uh, disclose what you are really doing in this, in this phase. Finally, the how. Um, I'm in the reporting space uh, and uh, I see the proliferation of reports. Yeah. We don't need more reports. We need more strategic information. Uh, we are living in an overload space of, uh, of information. And solution here is uh, core and more. Um, we, we implement that very successfully, in my opinion, uh, with the non-financial disclosure experience. And in particular, our core report is the management commentary, which is a mandatory one. And inside the management commentary, uh, which is our integrated report, by the way, we disseminate in a very integrated way all the information re related to the non-financial part, but only the core information, whereas the additional information, which are relevant for specific stakeholders, are in the more reports, for instance, in the website. So I think it's very relevant to distinguish between strategic information, core reports, and the other, other information. And as a risk uh, for the future, I see that 
this climate change stuff uh, is very relevant, it's quite clear, I see a risk of overload. And I think it's something that we, we have to discuss about that. Yeah. And Bastian, uh, linking that overload, um, from a standards perspective, um, what do you, you see as the challenges? Because you have developed a lot of uh, guidance or standards nowadays for a lot of types of indicators. And you engage a lot with stakeholders. What is your perspective? Well, well I think, I think to, uh, with regard to key performance indicators, what we see is a lot of consolidation. And, and I would refer to the TCFD as one of the uh, um, examples of that, where uh, a group came together, looked at what was created across a range of frameworks, and basically mm -hmm. said, well, essentially, the evolution uh, of, of this type of disclosure led us to a point that we have most of the indicators already. Yeah. The, 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 the additional contribution there was, was around uh, um, uh, adding the scenario analysis, which is a new piece, right, uh, uh, to bring uh, this link with non-financials and financials uh, closer to home of traditional reporting. Um, Challenges for us uh, as, as a standard setter for sustainability reporting are mostly in the domain of gaining more acceptance for this double materiality, as it was yeah. referred to by the Vice uh, Commissioner. Um, we have uh, still an issue that reports on non that, that are exclusively focused or integrated, uh, uh, um, that they focus on too much of the positive news, right? Uh, uh, may maybe too much of the positive impacts, and they avoid very, very... Uh, um, substantial uh, uh, parts of, of the impacts on others, on society, on stakeholders. And, and steering clear of that uh, has to do with establishing that notion that um, financial materiality is highly relevant, is regulated in different shapes and forms uh, globally. Uh, and there is no doubt that this is very much needed. Uh, but the same holds true for, for materiality that focuses on the impacts on others. Uh, and, and to have a real exercise of understanding what it is uh, um, uh, that you would want to express in a reporting exercise when, when you look uh, uh, more holistically at this perspective. And I think we, we were making great straits in, 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 in into that domain now, finally, by the Commission stipulating certain areas that were not reported before. When you look, uh, Richard was referring to human rights. I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing when you look back yeah. 10 years, yeah. there was hardly any mentioning of human rights at yeah. the time. and we're, So it's moving in the right direction, but from a standard setter perspective, we need to do more. Where we are invest now, for example, is that for sectors, we will come up with guidance for what is likely material for all the sectors, right? And not for only from a financial materiality perspective, but beyond that. So you think also being more transparent on the materiality process <coughs> will help well, reduce those positively biased uh, reports? Well, arguably, that there, there is always a judgment involved with materiality, and so there, there is something in the evolution, and when you think of reporting as a journey, there is, it's helpful to, to have expressions of what organizations consider material, uh, material and why. Uh, eventually, I think this, we can do away with that as a, in a reporting exercise, because the report will s speak for itself. If an organization does not acknowledge certain issues, it's pretty clear that it's not material. So we should look at reports also much more uh, taking them at face value. If an organization chooses not to report on something, it is not material from yeah. the perspective of the organization. Marty, do you want to add something from your perspective? Say that reporting means different things to different people and there is always seem to be a, I don't know, the excuse of maybe confusion in the market to sort of drive inertia or lack of change. And uh, I think there's often a lack of awareness of resources that are out there as well. And also training out there for the right sort of audiences, training out there for report yeah. preparers to help them take this um, the next, the next step and over the line. Um, I, you know, I would agree on the point of materiality, and um, but from our perspective at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board, we read at the moment literally hundreds of corporate reports from the non-financial reporting perspective. Loads of companies sending in um, their best go at a task force on climate-related financial disclosures report, and we're actually seeing sort of the opposite to what Bastian's seeing. We're actually seeing a lot of people reporting risks, but actually not really great opportunities. People are leaving that out, and we really need to make this more of a story and less of a checklist. Yeah, yeah. Especially the opportunities one. Um, can, you, can you elaborate, can you briefly say uh, some good examples that you saw about 
opportunities or I, I am also thinking about a lot of companies are responding to all these risks with changes in the business model, changes in their processes, like going to circularity. circularity. I, do you know, honestly, I can't say one good report I've read in the last week had really good uh, opportunities. We're, I mean, t Task Force, I mean, it's great people are taking steps forward, but the information is still really disconnected. It is sometimes in a separate report okay. that doesn't actually link back to the main report, isn't so really thinking about risks. We're not really, I mean, it's a big step forward. Two years in, it's, a, you know, if you hadn't already been doing CDSB's work before the Task Force came out, this is, a, you know, a huge new way of thinking within your business. And, you know, we'll probably come on to that. Yeah. But that is a challenge. Claudia, we have more questions, more linked to the investor perspective, but I don't know whether you wanted to add something before we go. I'm to fine now. No. Yeah. Then, then we have another uh, question to the audience, and uh, <laughs> I really hope that Slido is now working. But does the current reporting of non-financial information meet your needs as a stakeholder? Ah, wow. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'll take that. So we get a very political answer. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so let's dig into it. Um, what are stakeholders' experiences and expectations around non-financial reporting? And Claudia, if I can start then with you. Yeah, no, thank you. I thought that was a clear maybe. And uh, perhaps I could, um, I thought it might be useful if I talk a little bit about what our expectations are. So we invest around 480 billion euros across a wi wide range of invest investments. So that is the listed side, both equity and debt, but it is also the unlisted side, the private investments, be that real estate, infrastructure, etc. So our information needs are not limited to listed large companies, but they really span across the whole range of investments that we're looking at. We also um, run very quantitative strategies, and we run very fundamental strategies. And fundamental then is much more uh, qualitative research, analysis, going much more in depth than a purely quantitative approach would be looking for. So the kind of non-financial reporting or the data that we are looking for has to serve multiple purposes. In our capital markets portfolio, we run something called an inclusion policy. So a universe of 10,000 companies is, is assessed on whether they are an ESG leader or an ESG laggard. For that, we need a lot of data that is comparable between companies of a similar sector and also across a range of indicators that we have considered relevant. That then determines whether, on, under what condition one can invest. One can only invest in a laggard if one conducts engagement for change. Engagement requires a different kind of information. Then one would look at very clear ask about company performance to improve, and there also the more qualitative reporting would become very relevant. So if, if I'm looking at um, our experience with data at the moment, I think as everyone is calling for, we would like more and better data that is more meaningful and that is more investor relevant. We are a TCFD supporter and ourselves have also published a, a TCFD report and are actively encouraging companies to disclose these investor relevant climate financial disclosures. And so, uh, of course, very, uh, very much encouraged by the efforts of the European Commission on sustainable finance and as part of that also on, um, on, on the corporate reporting side. For us, the efforts of the CRD to work towards convergence of such reporting standards is actually very important and, and also the metrics. So that is certainly something um, for us to be encouraged. Thank you. And, and so I think we are all looking for the holy grail and I think that huh, mm. <laughs> about what type of information. Uh, this morning we also had discussion and we also said, well, 
also this dialogue, this continuous interaction with the investors is of importance to really know for what type of decisions they are using the information and that you can take that into account. Um, but also, I think what Massimo was also saying, well, it's also about it needs to be linked to really actually doing the business and how the business is guided and with the strategy being leading. And so I was also wondering, Massimo, what your views were looking at what you mentioned at the previous question about the strategy, strategy being very important. What are... What is your perspective from a preparer about a user? Right. Um, I would like to elaborate on uh, um, the investor side because we are preparers, but we are also investors. We manage yeah. more than four, 400 billion of uh, assets. Um, and my investment team told me uh, about this uh, um, this topic, uh, first of all, uh, the lack of uh, uh, homogeneous framework is something very relevant. Um, the good news is that on the climate change, TCFD is, is I mean, is, is the way and we, we support that. So this is a, a good news. On the other hand, uh, um, walk the talk consistently. This is something very relevant for, uh, for us as investors. So what we are looking for is a consistent uh, track record, uh, which is linked with the, with, the, with the strategy. So I think this is a very relevant uh, point. And, uh, and more generally, uh, I'm, I'm moving here from another perspective. I think there is a huge need for investor and analyst to increase the awareness of these topics, because nowadays, more generally, they need an Excel sheet, a number, and, uh, and boom, uh, you have the fair value. So I think uh, that community has to work on, uh, um, on, uh, on, on, this, on this area of, of understanding how all these different capitals will impact the fair value of the, of the asset. And I think there is a room for improvement there. Yeah. Just briefly coming back to you, Claudia, because Investors are very used to using, indeed, what you say, well, put the data, the metrics into the spreadsheet, more or less, and do all the analysis. For this type of information, the context is, becomes much more uh, of importance, and therefore also uh, the descriptive information. How are you really dealing with that in your analysis? And maybe Marty can briefly touch on that, too. Yeah, so we have um, a team of 17 responsible investment specialists who are sort of trained in the subject matter and work very closely with the portfolio managers. And I also wouldn't underestimate the capacity of portfolio managers not to just handle numbers but also qualitative information. So for them, um, analyst calls, financial reports, other information is equally relevant. And we often find that a good test is if you have the sustainability report and the annual report, if you compare the messaging and then discuss that with the CEO about um, whether it is actually the same strategy that is being proposed. Yeah. Um, Marty and Bastian, briefly, before we move to the next question, some reflection from you? Maybe in terms of capacity. Yeah. I think that, that extends beyond just uh, um, one stakeholder group. In we have finally reached the point that data is available, right? But what we meet is very many companies that say, much like Massimo. Um, so who can deal with this information and how do we get this feedback loop going? Uh, that extends to civil society, that extends to other, and there are very many efforts now to actually make that link and say, so, so once companies start to put information out, part of the journey should be feedback on, on, on that information, right? Uh, and through investor engagements, that's certainly happening much more than before, but there could be more in that space, there could be more with uh, civil society, we work a lot on the social issues with the labor unions, they could use this type of information to engage, not to base information yeah. on exclusively, but, but, but to, uh, to actually start this dialogue and, and that there is an opportunity there to advance this. Yeah. So the dialogue is just as important as, as, as uh, the investment decisions. Huh? Then back to the audience. Um, yeah, we do have a rush in, in this panel session. But the current interaction of financial and non-financial information, 
uh, as you can see it now. Very often there is some time lag in it. Uh, but as you see it right now, the interaction, how the two relate, is that sufficient? Can we immediately say, well, we have some non-financial information and this has a financial impact, for example? No, oh, this is, this is very definite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, politics are <laughs> taking over. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So thank you. Uh, I, I think the majority is indeed no, but there is some, apparently, so some interlinkages already seen. Uh, and if I. Nancy, may I elaborate on that? Um, from the technical. Yeah, very briefly. Yes, from the technical. <laughs> <laughs> time constraints. Okay, uh, materiality first. Um, uh, from the technical standpoint, this is a very critical uh, uh, element because uh, to measure the connection between financial and I, I like to call it pre-financial is, um, is very complex. Huh? Um, I think it's important to connect uh, this KPI with the strategy first. And I, I would like to mention a very interesting example I saw on, on the web is uh, uh, the example of SAP. The, uh, the mega IT vendor, uh, they are really measuring the connection between financial and pre-financial mm -hmm. in the website. Uh, and I think this is a great example of measuring this connection. So I, I advise all of you to, to have a look to at go. that. Yeah, yeah I, I think because we are really looking also for some practical examples. And Bastian, if I come to you about the interaction between financial and non-financial reporting. What is your view? Should there always be such a link? Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think for all ESG issues or sustainability issues that we're discussing nowadays in the public domain, there is a link with financials eventually, mm -hmm. right? The pre-financial notion is, is, is probably reflective of that. They deserve attention in their own right, but they also bridge into uh, the financial domain, and and I think when you look at the st stats here in, in, in the room, uh, um, opinions in the room, this is probably reflective of the um, current practice overall. That that while people appreciate that it exists, uh, and and the uh, integrated reporting movement is a testament to this, we haven't fully achieved that uh, bringing it together. Right. What's important for us as as GOI is that. Uh, um, you need to have a good understanding of an ESG impact, the impact on others, to uh, uh, then have any kind of analysis of a risk or opportunity for in a financial sense. And the TSF TCFD work, again, I think that, that is reflective of exactly that type of evolution where uh, mostly the TCFD has reconfirmed what non-financial reporting standard setters have come up with over the years, and then they have added an important piece on top of it. Um, where, where we see this headed is that there is more and more appreciation for this contextual information from the ESG, uh, um, and, and that there will be probably also the attempt to monetize some of these things, uh, and, and this will bring it together. That's much more easier done uh, that for environmental than for social subjects. Uh, um, I think a future where we monetize uh, um, uh, impacts on, on human uh, uh, capital in terms of the human rights impacts, for example, uh, that, that's probably not something we would advocate for. But th there are financial risks flowing from this type of behavior, and that's something you can clearly actually attribute uh, 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 um, uh, a, money, uh, a monetary value to. Maybe, maybe last thing is, is, is also interesting when you look at the interaction between non-financials and financials, just from recent work that we are doing, oftentimes there are also ESG issues. They, 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 um, we work on tax, corporate tax uh, 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 disclosure, and that's something that, interestingly enough, has not received a lot of attention from financial reporting. Uh, um, uh, standards, that is at least not producing the type of information that uh, stakeholders want to see, that's investors and, and civil society. And it's responsive to a larger societal debate. You can then say, this is a subject that you keep in this non-financial, pre-financial space, and it is responsive to uh, a, a social dialogue that's happening around what's a fair share of tax for corporates. But 
the same information is actually highly valuable just from a financial reporting perspective. You can actually disregard the whole societal notion of, of that subject matter. And, and, and so, so there could be also in, in, in the space in between traditional non-financial or pre-financial and financial, there could be issues that are actually promoted across uh, uh, from, from, from the non-financial space. And we believe that there will be many more uh, eventually if you look at climate change, it started off as a purely f environmental consideration and is now becoming mainstream. Yeah, yeah. I think a tax, we, we see a lot of developments currently with a fair tax share. Uh, but indeed, it, some, we always had some economic issues that didn't receive the attention. attention. I think also in the beginning when we had uh, GRI, the standards was very much focused on environmental and social. And we forgot more or less a lot of economic indicators. Mm -hmm. um, Marty, how, how do you think, from your standards perspective, what should be the interlinkage between the two of them? So we always like to think that we st a company starts with the story it wants to tell. You know, you don't want someone else to tell your stories. So you should think about the story you want to tell as a business. And then, and then the message you want to tell your shareholders, your stakeholders, and then decide which tools, frameworks, standards, etc., it has out there at disposal to do so, because they're different audiences, aren't they, for different different pieces of information? And so, with all of that in mind, we think that financial information should inform financial uh, non-financial information should inform financial performance. And so, for this to happen, we need to be talking the same kinds of language and preparing the same the information in the same kinds of way as you would financial information. So, at CDSB and uh, more broadly across all of our work, which is climate and natural capital or environmental focused, we believe that all the non-financial data should be collected and prepared with the same rigor as financial information. Use the same sorts of tools, formats, spreadsheets. You would financial information. Make this look as you know as comfortable as you can for yourselves as you bring these two together. You know, don't try and overcomplicate it. There's perfectly good financial reporting tools out there that have been there forever. Work out how you can get your non-financial information into those. Help. You know, that'll help bring the conversations together across the business. Um, put those same internal controls in place for that, for that information. We need it to be, you know, as robust as possible to stack up to assurance provisions if you decide to go, if, when you decide to go down that route. Um, I would apply the lens of risk and opportunity to all the information. And, you know, and one of the first steps before you even get started is really encouraging people to talk across the business, bring together people that work in all these different spaces, start the conversation and start working out how you can use what you've got, what tools you've already got, what information you already collect before you think about um, you know, going out and seeking new information. And we're seeing a lot of that with the two degree scenarios. People are making it really, really complicated. But you've been assessing risk and scenarios against other things in your business for years and years and years. Climate change is just you know, a new risk that's being considered amongst the mix. So, you know, think about what you've got. Think about processes you know and understand when you talk to the people around you. And if, you know, if it is a sustainability person and you're, you've been working on sustainability and, and traditional sustainability reporting for your career, think about when you go to talk to others in the business, think about language of risk and resilience. Th you know, think about how you can talk to others in the way they get it. And that will also, um, you know, help, help, help you know, make this all a bit, bit quicker. And I will just say one other thing, sorry, Nancy. Um, but with the TCFD reporting and, and non-financial reporting more broadly, I think it's really important to consider proportionality when we do that. We're hearing people saying, oh, I've produced a 30 or 40 page TCFD report. Big deal. You know, this is supposed to be integrated into your mainstream filing. This isn't another report. This isn't more information. You can put some of that elsewhere. Really think about the, you know, the nature of the risk and the amount of, amount of space it gets. You know, think back to the cutting the cutter movement so all those years ago. That was a powerful <laughs> speech, Marty. Oh, was it? But uh, I, d I do think that uh, really having it integrated, having the stone at the top, the CFO involved, and mm -hmm. what was mentioned, Having it in the mainstream, this morning we also had some discussion about that, and having it in corporate governance structures, internal controls, the, the full reporting process also helps with the integrity of the data and the robustness of the data that we were just talking about. Um, Claudia, from, from your perspective as an investor, are you really, for example, also looking for some transparency about this integrity of this full process uh, and, and that it gives you also some uh, trust in the, in the truly interaction between financial and non-financial and that it's being considered? 
Yeah, no doubt. I mean, ideally, pre-financial information would would meet the same requirements as as financial. Uh, data, but we recognize that that is still a journey. And I thought I could perhaps also add a perspective. Um, we are very interested in a growing body of academic work that looks at the link between ESG or sustainability and governance performance of companies and their financial performance. That is also being supported by a growing body that looks at that and the link to portfolio performance. Um, of investors. So therefore, for us, the translation into financial performance is very relevant. However, we also want the underlying data. So we don't um, use ESG ratings by other providers for the very same reason that we want to understand what is the actual performance and be able to compare that. So I think uh, while such a translation is very useful, there should also, be, within that process, be the transparency around the actual uh, performance on sustainability that is then be translated into financial performance. Yeah, yeah. So not just the talk, but also the walk. Yeah, the supporting evidence, yeah. because we really like granular data. Yeah. And talking about, as I also have interest, uh, about the technology, about having the data, mm -hmm. uh, would it be uh, helpful to have this in a standardized format to analyze it more quickly and to be able to compare? Or Yes, no doubt. In, in our case, the ESG information is fully embedded in our existing data systems and data governance structure. So the more it uh, resembles the financial information, the, the easier it is to integrate. Nancy, if, if I may, um, on yep. the data quality, I think uh, this is a very relevant topic in the non-financial space. And linked with that, uh, the role of assurance is another very relevant uh, um, element. And the role of the auditors in this space, uh, it's another relevant topic. So I think also that community has a big challenge in front of them because they are very strong on the financial. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have to evolve uh, on the non-financial space, in my opinion. Yeah. Should we include this in the curriculum for the uh, accountancy profession? You yes. should. Thank you. <laughs> I'm working <laughs> on that in the Netherlands. <laughs> but it's difficult. Um, I think let's, let's move on, because we are here. Um, oh, we already received some questions, because uh, during our discussion, all the time you can raise questions. Uh, first, I will finalize the panel discussion and then we'll move uh, to the questions. Um, so please add some questions if you like. About the European Lab, because this, was, this conference was on behalf of initiating the European uh, Lab. And I was really wondering about giving us also some inputs and what could be the role of the European Lab in really improving the non-financial reporting practices, but uh -huh, also that is not just the ones who are doing this already for a very long time on a voluntary basis, but also it's becoming mainstream. So how do we get this whole mainstream also very dedicated and have it in the core business function of reporting. So, Marty, do you have some views? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I kind of feel like CDSB has been a lab for until the TCFD came out because we were sort of plugging away at how you solve some of these, you know, more tricky financial, you know, cha challenges between integration of financial and non-financial uh, reporting that no one else really wanted to touch. So, um, everyone's already said this morning it's a lab, so by nature it needs to be innovative, and I think that's that's really important. So. You know, uh, often these sort of initiatives, you know, think, oh, we need to do this, but actually have a read. I urge you, you have a quick look around and say, oh, we need to do this. I urge you before you do that to have a really, really, really good look around to see what's already out there, what you can build on, and what you could could support or do differently. Um, we don't need um, any more reports, any more KPIs, any more, um, you know, big big proposals. What we really need is is sort of a how to. Um, solutions and uh, I'm calling 2019 and you know I've, I've sort of copyrighted this but beyond the hype you know we're all a bit sick for talking about it now it's about the how-to we've got you know new to TCFD is going out for a few years we've got the non-financial reporting directive now we really need how-to solutions to take this to the next level 
and uh, support the corporate you know, the, the changes in corporate reporting, but also those that just you know don't know where to get started. Um, there's also quite a few labs popping up around the world, and uh, I think it's important. And that's you know some based on the success of what we've had in the UK, but I think we need to look at what others are doing, and make sure that the the, the European effort um, is as globally applicable as well, but also draws you no know, demonstrates its leadership in that, but also draws on the work more broadly, at least across the G20. Um, and maybe even as a starting point, the Australian Accounting Standards Board recently issued practice statement to, sorry, I'm going to read this, on climate-related and other emerging risk disclosures as a framework for assessing materiality, which is a brilliant piece of guidance to support financial reporting in the absence of the International Accounting Standards Board being able to do anything there um, at this point. Um, so, yeah, let's look for solutions that can be scaled up, tools that can be scaled up, um, and we've all heard about the corporate reporting dialogue today from a number of different speakers. Uh, I, I, I do, again, I hope the lab looks at the outcomes of that work. And uh, Richard mentioned, and I'm going to use this as a bit of a cheeky plug, but Richard mentioned there's some consultations coming up on the work of the corporate reporting dialogue. CDSB is, in fact, tasked with doing the consultation workshops in Europe. Um, there's one in London, one in Paris, and one in Frankfurt. If you would like to attend, please give me your card in the drinks break and I will make sure you receive an invitation. Uh, <laughs> sorry, to come back to what I'm supposed but to talk about. But now to our European. Yeah, yeah. 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 now yeah. to this. Um, but that will yeah. all have an impact and be, be a supporting report tool for the, both, both groups of yeah. uh, work. Um, and as I've said, it's about moving beyond the hype. It's about training. It's about joining up existing non-financial and financial work and making sure we target the right audiences with the output. And I think that's also key because the accounting profession, we're about to launch some training, which is backed by the Global Accounting Association in this space, but it's just a start and it's only small. You know, we need to be taking this, you know, big and fast. Yeah. The other ones, just in uh, Sorry, one or two sentences, maybe, because I also want to give the floor. Yeah, but perhaps, you know, in the same way that the EU Action Plan on Sustainable Finance influences development globally, I think the EFRAG Lab has the same opportunity to do so. Yeah. Bastian? Yeah, I, I would invite the lab to really focus on this extension of the materiality notion and provide more guidance to the profession on that, because this is where the biggest pushback is, I think, right now. Uh, um, and and so, so looking at this uh, would enable actually probably I the true incorporation in already existing processes. Uh, oftentimes non-financial information, the scope of it is wrong because the people who inform the discussion around scope think too much into in, in the traditional mindset and, and that's, that would be one, one thing that we would recommend. Oh, Massimo. Well, uh, my colleagues already cover all the stuff. Uh, again, materiality, I think this is a very relevant topic. And more generally, I think uh, sharing best practices uh, is very relevant for users and for, for the market. Yeah. Thank you. Let's also go to the audience and the questions in the audience. I cannot go with the microphone through the audience, and that's why we asked you to raise questions online. And... Uh, is there a particular tag uh, to it or, sorry? Yeah, but because it says, L okay, L-E-E. -E. Okay, oh, this is first name, sorry. <laughs> I, th I think, um, I think it was the main problem. I think I'll start a little bit in the middle. What is the main problem investors encountered vis-a-vis -vis current disclosures? What yes. do you miss mostly, for example? So you already said more and, and better information, but if I make it more pragmatic, yeah. Much more practical. Mm, uh, so, what so are you looking for? So more in terms of, I mean, there are some ex there are some examples of uh, excellent reporting by companies, but I think we need to recruit more companies uh, to the course, and also that the information um, is not always relevant for investors, mm -hmm. and um, it is sometimes also the quality of the information, and for us, ideally, um, it is comparable between at least companies in the same sector. Because um, th that's, uh, that's what we need. Yeah. And one should also think of it as investors, in, in, as a Dutch pension fund investor, we are subject to a climate stress test by the Dutch central bank. 
So we need the disclosures from our investments in order to fulfill such a requirement and we also conduct our own scenario analysis, etc. Yeah. I ha also, um, yeah, I don't know whether other people uh, from the panel want to add, no? Because then I want to go also for the first question. Uh, does the panel think it's more important to have smaller amounts of relevant information or large pools of accessible data. So it's a little bit, is indeed less is more? Or do you want to have this broad set of information? What we often hear is right now, every time more and more and more information is being asked from us to produce. Uh, but what is really being done with it? So do we need less but better information or do we need more information to better place it in the context? And Bastian and then Massimo. Yeah. Well, I, I, think, I think one answer to this is there needs to be arguably consolidation. There are too many questions asked about the same subject matters uh, in different ways, and that's confusing and that's overwhelming. Is it small amounts or larger pools? I think each of the issues in non-financials, climate is an example, mm -hmm. there are many others, they are highly complex subject matters. To find proxies for corporate performance in these areas, you're talking by definition about larger pools of information. It's not going to be one KPI each. Uh, um, uh, that's, that's not a reality that's scalable and would lead to decision useful information. But at the same time there, we also have seen a trend of catalogs of 100 questions about one subject matter, and that's probably also the wrong direction. That can be consolidated for sure. So four, five, six disclosures max for, for a subject matter, that might be a, a scalable reality. And, and the other thing we find is that even while Claudia was referring to, we need comparable information within a sector, the questions that you ask, the generic questions about a subject matter, whether that's human rights or uh, things like water, occupational health and safety, um, these tend to be the same ones for the different sectors. The way they're filled in is slightly differently and that needs to be scalable and comparable, but, but, but uh, we believe as, as GOI that there, are actually, uh, um, uh, there, there is a future where, where most of these subject matters can be standardized on a generic level. Yeah. Should we, should we, for example, also ask then all the rating agencies and etc. to work more together rather than... I know companies where they have a few FTEs just working on responses to all the different investors and, and rating org companies. Uh, it's a f more than full-time job. Yeah, I, well, from GI's perspective, we don't see a future where you compete in a market for ratings uh, um, uh, just on the basis of asking difficult questions and many questions. Uh, it's about the analysis of data and, and adding value there, so, so that will be the future. But maybe that was a necess uh, necessity up till now, but we already see consolidation in, in that market as well. Yeah. Right? Massimo. Well, in, in the next three, five years, uh, what I see is uh, not anymore a, um, um, a dualism between financial and pre-financial information, but more the strategic information, which is uh, the, the most relevant one. Um, uh, secondly, I think that everybody should be aware that every information has a cost, uh, as, as a preparer, so I know, I know that very well. So we have to uh, manage very carefully the production of information because, again, there, there is a cost uh, behind, uh, behind that. Again, here I think a core and more could be a, a solution. In the core report, you have the strategic information. In the more reports, you have other, other information. Um, in the future, um, yeah, you have the automation, robotics, and stuff like that. We can mm -hmm. help to manage information. But as a human being, uh, we, we have to we can manage only a limited set of information. So I tend to, 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 to believe that strategic information is the solution. Yeah, then the question from, from Michael, for it, which steps into it. If we go to this less information, should we also have uh, a smaller set, define a smaller set of pre-financial KPIs to facilitate comparability? Is there a need for that? That's a very uh, interesting point. Kind of common uh, indicators. As, uh, as Mardi said, uh, this is our story, and we have to communicate on the pre-financial based on uh, our entity-specific strategy. On the other hand, uh, there is a need for sure of uh, uh, comparability 
I tend to believe that comparability, the key comparability is uh, for the company year by year. But in, in the short term, there, there will be the need of a comparability among sectors. Uh, TCFD, for instance, could be a solution for the climate change. But again, if you are asking me 20 KPIs, uh, we have a problem yep. because yep. we miss the K. No, no. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I, I don't want to do any more questions because it's, uh, it's time for the coffee break, but I do want to wrap up. And uh, I do want to wrap up with the panel. Um, and if you want to give the audience a one-minute message based on our discussion that we just held, what would it be? Claudia, can I start with you? Yeah, um, you know, I think the the, the field of um, of corporate reporting continues to be certainly on the pre-financial side continues to be one of innovation. So I think, you know, that's the path we are still on, and we shouldn't forget that. Yeah, good. Well, Bastian, I, I, I think I think the one thing that that we try to push is that non-financials are resourced adequately. Because a lot of the pushback around it is also around people not understanding that if you want to embrace it, it will require resources. Uh, I think Massimo just referred to that. It's, 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 it's one of the biggest problems that we see, that people say, we, I only have three people to respond to this. Well, if this is the investment of a multinational into non-financials, that's probably the wrong start. And, and, and so embracing that there's right resourcing needed for these type of activities is very important. Yeah. Um, Marty, I'd just say climate is just, just the start. You know, it was one of the first, first sort of key indicators we had out there. But the principles and requirements that you know for things like the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, they were lifted straight from CDSB. They can apply to anything and social or environmental. So my advice to you as businesses, don't wait for the next TCFD to come along. Actually start thinking now about how, you, how those can be applied across broader parts of your business and, you know, and lead and own your story going forward. Massimo, what would you like to say to If the technology will help me, I have a one slide, just to recap. Can you, can you show <laughs> that? Hey, that's cheap. So, uh, the right corporate reporting inspires Egg. the right action, but... It's a long journey. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think this is uh, very relevant. Yeah. And I, I, I like to say, well, we are indeed on this journey of change. And I think what we have learned and also uh, what the panel mentioned, on a journey of change, you need to, to embrace all stakeholders and bring them along your journey of, of uh, change. And therefore, stakeholder engagement is very important. We will never get an end solution in reporting. Every time new themes will pop up, and therefore, this engagement is very key. And I want to I, uh, fi uh, finish with uh, Nietzsche, who said, well, there are really no facts at all. It's all about interpretations. <laughs> 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 Thank you. Thank you for the panel. <laughs>